Okay. Uh, they, they have been some feedback about the course that having two languages makes life harder. And then focusing on Haskell and then focusing on Rust. And actually, I really would like to have focus on Kotlin as well, because Kotlin has a certain things that are quite nice, which are not necessarily covered uh, in the uh, fifth semester um, a mobile course, uh, and they have to do with asynchronous programming. And uh, different programming languages have quite a different kind of uh, take on asynchronous and concurrent programming. And Kotlin has kind of a nice, um, nice take, which is a little bit unique. And I really would like to have Kotlin in the course as well. But already having two languages makes a bit of a kind of a fight. And then having three would be even harder, right? Uh, but the main point the, the, the main point of me is that this course is not about you learning Haskell or about you learning Rust. Um, we do need to have some fundamentals about Haskell and Rust to learn about the concepts, but it's not that you can actually learn uh, Rust or Haskell in this course. Yeah, it, it takes much longer than, than we have space for. Um, also, it takes a really long time to learn a programming language. It's not something that you can learn in a semester. It takes kind of a long time and long practice. Um, so that is like, you know, all those things like, okay, learn something in 30 days, that those are all kind of a crap. Uh, and then you see that people are kind of going away from that. Um, so the more you learn something, the, the more you actually understand what you don't know, and then you actually know that you don't know it, right? <laughs> so I don't know Rust and I don't know Haskell, uh, but I know Rust and Haskell probably more than uh, an average student, uh, but I know a lot of things I don't know. Uh, but you, like if someone says, I know C++, that's an extremely suspicious statement, okay? Because there will be things that person doesn't know about C++, okay? For sure, I, am, I can guarantee you. Even Bjorn, <laughs> doesn't know C++ like completely. He would not state that, right? Uh, he knows that there are things that are kind of uh, tricky. And uh, yeah. So anyway, the, the, the first part of the lecture is about Rust. But the second part is a little bit kind of explanation of why we have two languages in the course and why certain way of learning is actually effective. Um, so let's start with Rust. So, um, all right. Uh, Rust setup is super important. So uh, I cannot stress that enough um, that you do need to have um, kind of a setup both for Haskell and for Rust done in such a way that you get most of the, of the setup. Um, so you should obviously automate as much as you can with uh, CI. Um, although automating with CI with Haskell is kind of painful because the images Docker images for Haskell are quite bulky and uh, running the pipelines is quite uh, cumbersome actually. Uh, so it may not be feasible for Haskell, but it should be feasible for us. Definitely use tests. So we've been doing doc tests and uh, unit tests for Haskell and for Rust from day one. Uh, so use it and then use Clippy. So I had a, a little bit of a demo. Let me uh, get to my... Where is my, yep. So I have a little bit of code, like I was playing a lot with code. Um, yeah, I think this, this will do. So here I have some code. And normally you have set up uh, VS code or, um, or your IDE to use a cargo check. And cargo check doesn't catches a lot of things. Um, so for example, I have this, this code snippet here. And what is wrong with this code? Well, it may not be obvious, right? Uh, actually, it looks kind of okay-ish. Uh, and you don't really feel that the code smells, uh, but uh, if you take this code into account, 
there are kind of a two major problems with this code. Uh, and it may not be obvious when you're learning, like once you get exposed to it, you will probably see it. But when you're not exposed to it, you probably don't see it. So the best way to see it is to ask Clippy to help you. So if you uh, change, like if you go to settings and you say, I have dust analyzer. Yeah, like uh, check on save. So you should uh, run check on save in your, um, yeah, you should have this uh, Rust analyzer kind of a check on save being uh, ticked. And then um, there is, uh, I always have kind of problems finding where the things are, but if you find kind of a Rust analyzer settings, you can go there and instead of running the check command being check, if you change it to Clippy, uh, obviously you can run Clippy manually, right? So you can always run cargo Clippy uh, in your command line and get all the, the warnings and everything there, but it's kind of not that usable. It's best to have it in your, in your ID. So if we change that, and if we go back to our code, and if I if I save it, then bam, your Clippy kind of tells you like, okay, there are two things which are kind of smelly here. So one thing that is smelly is that you actually don't using a vector for a vector. It's like a fixed size and we never expand beyond that fixed size and we never go lower or higher. So why don't, you, don't we use an array, right? Uh, yeah, fair enough. We probably shouldn't use vector here. We should use an array. Uh, this one is kind of a um, optimization slash uh, current code uh, centric because maybe in the future we will do something with V, uh, but you know the compiler knows we're not doing anything else with V, so we should use vector. The other one is a little bit more nuanced. So the other one is something that many of you do already. Uh, where you use the, the match um, pattern and you have the happy path with the, uh, sorry, you have the happy path with some and you have unhappy path with none, okay? But in this particular case, what we're really doing is we extracting the value out of the box and then having a default unless the box is empty, like unless we have none, right? So if we have none, we saying, okay, we will default to zero uh, because we, we kind of are uh, assigning here the second value, right? So we are defining what the second value is and we have two cases. The default case for the box being empty and the case where the box is not empty. And there is a kind of a, a, a clever way of doing it. And a Clippy will kind of tell you, it's like, sec, you know, unwrap or, right? So we are unwrapping the value or having a default. So instead of doing pattern matching, which also achieves the task, it's much simpler to just use it with the single uh, method, uh, which is what the suggestion is. So we can replace the whole block like this with this. Which one reads better? Which one is better? Well, this one is better, right? why this one is better. It's more concise, more shorter, there is less reading and less possible things to go wrong. So objectively, this one is better. It's not just a matter of style, it's kind of objectively better, right? So you should kind of, uh, you should do that. Um, yeah, so we save it and then Clippy is happy and we can uh, fix this one. We can use array directly and then Clippy is happy. Look, no wiggles anymore, right? So using Clippy will actually teach you some of the idiomatic patterns of Rust as well, right? They are there for a reason. Um, all right, so use Clippy. Um, this is my programming flow, but I think it's common to many people. So how do we program? How do we do it in Rust? How do we do it in Haskell? Well, first we kind of make certain design choices. We decide 
to use recursion or we decide to use loops or we decide to use iterators or, or we decide to have certain data structures. So we kind of a plan in our head what we will have, like what structs do we will we have and then what sort of roughly speaking we will do with them. All of this happens in your head first, right? So it doesn't happen with your fingers on with the keyboard and, and, and screen, it kind of happens in your head. So then you design, start designing your data structures and the signatures of your methods. And then you get the feel if the data structures and signatures of your methods are what you want to work with. Uh, you modify it, you iterate. So first you iterate in your head, then you iterate with your actual signatures and the data structures. You haven't started coding anything yet. You just kind of are planning what you will play with, right? What you will have. Uh, and then test-driven development suggests that you should start writing tests first. And I like that. I actually do that. Why? Uh, first of all, I kind of hate writing tests. So when I have to write tests afterwards, I never do it. Uh, so that means I will not have tests. Um, and then the, the main reason is I like to play with the API. I like to play with the data structures and the method signatures that I designed such to get a feel if I like it, right? So when you're writing a test, you have to use your methods, you have to pass parameters, and then you kind of feel, yeah, that sucks. Using it this way sucks. So you go back and you change it, right? So it's a very cheap iteration over your data structures and signatures to get kind of a feel if you like it. And then if you like it, great. Then you start coding your bodies. Right, and I usually start doing all the bodies by defaults and by unimplemented and as quick as possible to get stuff to compile. So I actually don't implement anything. I just make it compile and do nothing. And all the tests will fail and everything will be fine, but the, the code kind of compiles, right? So I try to go to this step very quickly to pass it and get to this step. So um, I have, Something that doesn't work, it doesn't do anything yet, but compiles, okay? And I'm happy with the signatures and I'm happy with my data structures. So I kind of get to that point. And then, okay, I, I start implementing the bodies and getting the tests to pass. So not all the tests will pass initially, but some tests will pass and I'm getting more and more bodies into the functions. So that's where I kind of do the coding. And then once this is done and all the tests pass, I kind of uh, reiterate over the implementations to try to see if the some of the code smells, right? Uh, but I don't do that until I have all the tests pass and un until my code actually solves the problem. Um, because I may decide I need to change signatures, I may decide to change things up here, so then re-implementing in an idiomatic way doesn't make sense yet, right? So I'm I'm kind of getting to this point and then I'm trying to fix things to be kind of idiomatic. So many of you did that for Oblix. Many of you got to the point where it actually solves the tasks, but it's not idiomatic Rust or it's not idiomatic Haskell. It, it sort of is C++ Rust or C++ Haskell, right? Uh, it's really hard to have C++ Haskell, but in Rust you can kind of cheat and get C++ way of solving things in Rust, right? And it will do the task, but it's wrong. It's not Rust. It's just C++ and Rust syntax, okay? Um, so then you're kind of actually looking at it and trying to improve it, to make it actually Rust-like. Um, and then if you have to consider performance. So we don't, I, I don't consider performance until I kind of hit the, the limit that, okay, I did something, it takes really long time, I don't like waiting so long, I need to fix the performance, right? So then I get to the performance considerations. Uh, it's, a, it's a completely separate step. It's, it has nothing to do with coding, uh, nothing to do with all those previous steps. All right, so then what is the performance checklist? So I always do this checklist. Uh, I check what I allocate and what I clone and what I copy and how things are moving around. Um, when I say I always do this check, I, I never do this check in Golang and I never do this check in Haskell, right? But in Rust, I do this check. In C++, I do this check. In C, I do this check. So in languages where I am responsible for memory management, I have to do this. In languages that are taking this responsibility from me, I am so happy that I don't do that, right? So in Golang or, or um, 
or in Haskell, I don't, uh, but uh, in Rust, I that's the first thing I do. I check, okay, do I call clone somewhere? Do I kind of call copy some, somewhere? How do I allocate stuff? Is it on heap? Is it on, on, um, uh, on stack? Like I'm reusing memory or I am allocating and deallocating it? Like how, how, how that happens? It's super important for performance. Um, how many passes over data do I do? Uh, do I do a single pass or do I do multiple passes? Why do I need to sort the data? No, okay. Like what, I, what I'm doing with the data. And then this one is, that, that one I will probably cover next week. Uh, it's a separate topic. Uh, it's about how we organize data in our data structures. It's super important and we have bad habits from object-oriented programming. Um, so I will talk about it separately next week. All right, if I did this, if I said, okay, I checked my memory management, I checked my loops, I'm happy with all of, all of this. Uh, is it still too slow? Sometimes it is, most of the time it isn't, but sometimes it is too slow. Then we need to do something, what, what we need to do. So we've coded the solution, it solves the task, it is idiomatic and we are not doing any stupid things with memory management or loops, but it's still too slow. Then what do we do? We do profiling. Why we do profiling? Well, because we need to know what needs to be fixed. We don't know what is making the code slow and we don't know what can make it faster, right? So if you said uh, we will do code optimizations, like what sort of code optimizations, which functions you're gonna optimize? You don't know which ones are the slowest. You don't know where the problems are. So you cannot start optimizing if you don't know what you need to optimize for. Uh, and parallelization, yes, you could, but maybe that is not the problem. Maybe the problem is in a function that is very monolithic, that runs only once, it has to pass the data sequentially and parallelization is not gonna help. So you do need to do profiling. Uh, so Typically we think about profiling in terms of CPU profiling, like where are we spending CPU cycles on? Uh, fair enough, then you do flame charts and flame graphs to kind of see which functions, which parts of your code are the slowest or taking the longest time. Sometimes the longest taking time functions cannot be optimized, like because that's the way it is, like it has to be that way. But sometimes you can optimize them. So you need to know where the kind of a sweet low hanging fruits are and then you need to do those charts. And then from the charts, you can make the decisions. You also need to know like what happens with memory. Like, uh, is it the memory, like, do we have memory leaks? Do we have memory problems? So memory profiling is important. And then you can also analyze some functions are slow and it's because of the IO. So maybe you can actually do some async IO or do some things that kind of helps. So you kind of need to do profiling. You need to identify what you can improve because trying to improve in like, you know, just taking code and improving it, yeah, that's not gonna work. And everything you think about what makes your code slow at this point is wrong. Uh, you actually need to measure it. Um, Yes, yeah, so cache misses, I will talk about it next week. So there's cache locality and kind of uh, optimizing your data structures, I will talk later. Uh, so then based on the results of your profiling, you can actually do some optimizations or you can think about parallelization, right? Okay, so um, if you are thinking about parallelization, uh, then you have to think what by design have to be asynchronous. And if it has to be asynchronous, do I want or do I have to run it on, like at the same time, parallel or just concurrent? So this distinction between um, 
concurrency and parallelism starts to play the role, right? On the design side, we only think about what needs to be sequential and what needs to be concurrent. But on the optimization side, we need to differentiate between parallelism and concurrency. Again, in some languages uh, like Haskell, you sort of don't care. And in some languages like Golang, you also don't make a very strict distinction be because the runtime system will do some of those things for you. So they will spawn certain threads and kind of uh, shuffle things around concurrently and for pa achieving parallelism. Uh, but you kind of don't really need to deal with the details. You only deal with the concurrency part, right? Um, and then there is kind of a in very interesting um, um, consideration also, like we all always think about parallelization in terms of things that happen at the same time, okay? But imagine that you have some data pipeline, you're doing some processing and it's like yay big and it has to be done in sequence. Like you cannot parallelize that, okay? But you can still take advantage of the parallel hardware because what you can do is you can say, yeah, I have to do that amount of work but I can split it in eight chunks, okay? And then each of the chunk can be done on a separate thread. So I will do the first part here over and over again with my data flow. And I will do that second part concurrently or in parallel over here on this core. And it will take data from this one and does it over and over again, right? So now we have uh, kind of the pipeline where we are doing multiple things at the same time, but achieving kind of a flow, data flow, right? So the throughput will be better because before we're doing all those eight things on a single core. Uh, now we're doing all those eight things on eight cores. So that it's, you know, hopefully certain amount of uh, uh, factors faster, but we kind of um, didn't change the latency, but we changed the throughput. Right, so the, the data throughput, if we're doing this over and over again, will be faster if we kind of parallelize it this way. So the processing pipeline is important and CPUs do that. So CPUs themselves have kind of internal pipelines uh, to make certain things being done in, in parallel, even though the se sequence of operations is kind of like a sequential, right? Not parallelization like of everything doesn't make sense. Uh, so you kind of need to see when you will have benefits or not. So async is a separate thing uh, because we're doing async to achieve concurrency and we're doing it for the kind of a logical logical reasons. What is that plane doing here? It's super low. Is it the military plane? It looks like it's going into the, into the military one. I think it might be landing in Palmas and Houston Yeah, it's a kind of a worrying sign because we fly here <laughs> with those uh, small um, paragliders <laughs> and you don't want to be next to big flying machines. Uh, yeah, I got some notifications from friends from uh, Oslo that also some of the uh, areas which normally were restricted to the paragliders or to, to kind of a, uh, soaring planes now are used by military and they don't need to issue kind of uh, warnings because they are military. So it, it becomes a little bit kind of worrying uh, where we can fly and when it's unsafe. Anyway, coming back to Rust. So... Um, Fortunately or unfortunately, when you're programming in Rust, you kind of need to think about certain things you don't have to think about when you're programming in Haskell or programming in Golang. First thing is memory. You do need to think about like how memory is allocated, deallocated, and how memory is accessed and shuffle around. Uh, it's super important in Rust. Otherwise, your program will not compile. And you probably observe that that's a little bit painful, right? Um, the language has a certain kind of a model of how things should work and it imposes it on you by the compiler. The other one is uh, the CPU usage. Uh, so again, like how you are using it, uh, how you're making the, the, um, the use of the CPU resources and that relates to concurrency versus parallelism. So in Golang, 
you only care about async, like you spawn your functions asynchronously, but you actually don't care if they are run in parallel or not. Uh, like the runtime system will decide what's the best for it, right? Uh, in Rust, well, you're either using async library or parallel library. They are not the same. They are kind of for different purpose and you have to make your own a distinction when you want something to be run concurrently or where you want something to be done in parallel. Um, so it's a little bit more, you, you have to put more thought into it. But the, the biggest one is the memory. So uh, when you're programming in Rust, you always have to kind of keep the mental model of how memory is used and how memory is accessed. And, um, and that leads us to the concept of idiomatic patterns. Like how do you actually program idiomatically in Rust? Uh, so as I suggested, like use Clippy as a, as a learning tool. Uh, but you also have to learn this kind of idioms yourself. Um, so question, what is a collection? It is a little bit tricky question um, because that, that question is not really about collections, but like, give me examples. Like what is a collection? So in programming languages, yeah, you give me examples. But if you were to explain it to a 10-year-old who never programmed anything, what would you say it's a collection is? Yeah, I like this one. I like the, the concept of a container or a box, right? Um, so it can be a container for things of the same type. So like a vector or a list. Yeah, those are examples of collections. But it can also be just a box for one thing. It's also kind of conceptually, uh, you, like normally from C++ or Golang, you, you wouldn't call it a collection. But actually from Haskell point of view and Rust point of view, uh, boxes with one single single thing are also collections because they have iterators on them, right? <laughs> so then the mental model is like, um, it's sort of like a container that has stuff inside and you can do stuff on the container or on the items inside. And if it's a container with just one item, yeah, that's also a container, right? Uh, so kind of a collection, you, you kind of need to broaden your concept of a collection a little bit beyond just like a vector or array or map. Um, because it, it is like uh, option type or enums are also kind of a kind of uh, things that can be looked inside that they are kind of containers, right? So that's uh, fair enough. We can do that. Um, it's a little bit difficult to um, to explain it, but even if it is difficult to explain, you do need to have a mental model what those things are and how you use them abstractly speaking when you're programming, right? Um, so you may kind of spend a little bit of time thinking how would you explain it? So yes, you already gave me some examples of collections that you often use, but give me, uh, uh, yeah, let's skip that one as well. Give me a functions. So we assume that you, we kind of agree what different collections are, what those containers are. Like now tell me functions that we can use on the collections, on those containers. So what useful functions did you use yourself or you know about? Yep. We can sum the items in the container. We can fold over them. We can filter them. We can get the first one. We can push add items to the to the container. Uh, yeah, what other functions kind of come to mind? We can check the length. Yep. We can check the containment with contains. Excellent. So there are. Um, certain functions that um, we can do on the containers. What else? What's the one that we use the most? 
So, so the most we use access, like getting kind of an, an item out of the container, but the, the second most one, we iterate over. So we kind of uh, loop over the items, right? Um, so iteration over um, uh, over the items, like map is a, a special case where we apply some logic to it, but we can also just iterate and get element by element. So iteration or enumeration over the, the container is kind of uh, very common. So now if you have those uh, languages, and if you count how many different functions did you use on the containers, uh, which language would kind of uh, be the most containing most functions and which one will be sort of uh, containing least number of those different functions. So in terms of how many different functions you've used in the language, uh, how would you rank the, the, the languages? Yep. I will type in the ranking order. I don't know <laughs> how people are doing it. Sure. You drag it. Right. So it is somewhat not surprising, right? Uh, if you're coming from C, you basically have a for loop. <laughs> and yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, you don't have much. Um, JavaScript has maps and for each. So it has a little bit of iterations. Uh, Golang also is a little bit weak. It is not as rich as C++. So C++ has quite a lot. So C++ standard library, especially the modern incarnations, they do have quite a lot. Uh, they have filters with, uh, you know, um, anonymous functions and things like that. So they are not uh, so far, but Haskell stands out. Haskell has quite a lot of different things to use with, uh, with containers. And it's the same for Rust. It, Rust will be a little bit weaker, but it's kind of much, much bigger than C++, right? Uh, in terms of those facilities. Uh, what is annoying a little bit about Rust is that because of the expressiveness of uh, of the syntax and of the of the language, most of it has to be defined as functions, and most of it is not generic. So you actually have to check for the particular type what those functions are. So you have to use quite a heavy use of the documentation or, or the code completion to know what is available to you. So not everything is available, right? Like in Haskell, if we have a functor, we know everything that uh, uh, everybody who has the kind of a functor uh, type class will have a certain functions which you can apply on, and those functions are the same. But with the with Rust, sometimes it feels similar, but sometimes it, it doesn't. So for example, a concept of a map or fmap uh, in Haskell is quite generic, uh, but in Rust, it's not generic. The implementation is actually done per type uh, because you cannot express certain things in a kind of a generic way. Um, but you do have map or, or fmap uh, in, in Rust as well. So there is a lot of uh, parallels between Haskell and Rust on, on, that, on, that con um, on that level. But my point here is that C like, like really stands on the other extreme, like it's, it's a very limiting in terms of what you can do. You have to do a lot of things manually. And unfortunately, we have to recognize that you are biased with the, with the first language you've learned to be very familiar with for loops and, and if statements and trying to solve everything with for loops and if statements, right? Uh, What's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong is that you basically kind of handicapping the some languages to be like C and there is no need for it. You can take advantage of the facilities that those languages offer. It takes time. It takes kind of to, to understand those patterns. And, but you should try to avoid solving everything with if statements and for loops um, in those other languages. Like in C, yes, fine. But in those other languages, try to learning a language is not 
how to use for loops and if statements in, in this language. That's not what this language is about. It's about solving it the way that language is designed for you to solve it, right? So if there is a filter facility, you should use filter. Of course, you can co program it with for loops and if statements, but that would be wrong, right? Um, all right, so collections. Um, yes, vectors, strings, hash maps, some generics, uh, and sub, some, some type systems. Some things are trivial, okay? How do we use vector? Yeah, same like in Rust, same thing as in C++. There is almost nothing new apart from some of the nuances about the syntax. Um, so you can say generically, there is a vector of something. We don't know of what until we start adding to it. We can say um, that vector is of this type because we declare the variable of this type, uh, or we can call a specific constructor uh, which kind of maps the, the type. So that, you know, uh, it's just syntax. Um, vectors contain uh, elements of the same type. So same as in most programming languages, um, unlike uh, JavaScript, <laughs> uh, the, the co container has items of the same type, right? Uh, adding elements, easy, getting elements. Uh, so where is the getters? Yeah, so we have getters here. So normal uh, reading elements with index, right? Okay, looks fine, but uh, frown upon in Rust. You should not use it in Rust if you can avoid it, right? Um, we will talk a little bit about it. So collections. So we have to think in when when we're talking about collections in Rust, we have to think, okay, uh, what's in the box? Is it a value? Is it a reference to a value? Uh, is it like how is it like a robbed value? So it's like an option. So we have a vector of options of something. Uh, how do we manage ownership? Normally. Uh, the outer thing is owned by the collection. So whatever the outer thing is, and I put it into my vector, the vector owns it, right? Um, you can put reference, uh, but then you have to decide, like, uh, are you putting it as a, a, as a um, kind of an own thing or not? And also what's inside the wrapping you manage the ownership as well. Like, uh, how do you do it? Is it by value? Is it by reference and so on? So it gets quite complicated quite quickly, right? Uh, in languages like Golang or, or Haskell, you don't think about it because you don't think about memory so much that that all is taken care of for you. But here, yeah, you kind of need to think like, okay, I have a box. Uh, is the box of other boxes? What's inside the box and who owns what, right? And do, how do I do the ownership and how do I do the wrapping and how do I do the ownership? So th that complicates things a little bit and it makes working with some of the uh, things harder or some of the things easier. Um, all right, so uh, we don't try, we try not to do that. Uh, why we try not to do that? Because if you go out of the uh, index range, you're gonna crash your program. And we don't write programs which are crashable, right? So we try to write programs that if there is something wrong, the program can kind of recover and tell me that something is wrong, especially if you have it running on the server side and so on, right? Um, I've heard some, some people uh, advocating that because of serverless, if something crashes, it automatically restarts it then you don't have to care about crashing your programs. That's bullshit, right? <laughs> Come on. Um, so we use, um, so like try to avoid indexes. If, you add, if you're using indexes, sure, for the first iteration of your code, use indexes, no problem, right? Uh, but then when you kind of rewriting it, like refactoring it to be more idiomatic, uh, try not to use indexes. So it is kind of, um, a deprecated concept. And even in C++, even in C++, in modern C++, you are much more encouraged to use iterators instead of ac directly accessing through indexes, right? Um, so try to use iterators as much as you can. If you need to get individual element, uh, we will do this get thing. And the get thing will get us an option. 
so if the index is out of bound, we will not crash the program. It will not panic, but it will give us none, right? So the, it will return a value which is none uh, or um, nothing in, in Haskell. So then we have to do this matching and then I will show you like how to avoid some of the things uh, with match as well. So match is a very common pattern in Rust. But Clippy will also tell you, like, you should not abuse it. Like, there, there are simpler way of, of dealing with some things uh, without doing a match. So here we have um, a simple example of doing two things. Uh, so we're getting an index out of bound. And if we got none, we will print that v4 is out of bound. If it is within the bounds, we will print that the value, right? Um, and we're using match. So, yep, that's kind of a one way of dealing with gets. Um, but typically, um, typically we don't do this. Uh, typically we need to get an element for further processing, right? So normally we, we don't have cases like this where we actually printing this or printing that. It's a very, uh, you know, uh, artificial kind of a scenario. Normally we getting a value and doing something with the value. And then in case we have none, we want to kind of propagate that none or not crash, right? So in, in Haskell, we had this kind of a concept of a happy path. And then if something was kind of, um, jumping into unhappy path, we were like quitting. We were kind of uh, shortcutting it, right? With with option or with maybe types. So it's the same here. Uh, if we need to do something with this, uh, so for example, we need to uh, print uh, the value, uh, we have if let. So if let is a kind of a pattern matching, which says if this matches, we will get X matched to the value. If it doesn't match, which means we have none, we, we, we say v get, we get none, this will not match. So then we will not do anything, right? So it will not panic, it will not crash the program, it will just ignore it, right? Uh, sometimes it's fine. Sometimes you want to do something and then ignore the unhappy path. Sometimes you cannot ignore it, you, you need to take some action. So you will say else, and then you will decide what to do with the unhappy path, right? Um, so if let is kind of a, often a replacement for match because it's sort of simpler. Uh, so use if let if, if, if possible. So is that code kind of a uh, fine for everybody? Yeah. All right. So then um, in other languages, like in C and Frode told you that, uh, Nikolai told me that uh, Frode is teaching you about Sentinel values. It's fine. I mean, you have to use Sentinel values in C. What are Sentinel values? Uh, those are special values. Like if you have an H and then it's minus one is like a certain meaning that something is not said or whatever, right? Zero sometimes is a special meaning. Empty string is a special meaning. Empty tuple is a special meaning. So in many languages, we use Sentinel values because that's the way we deal with uh, sort of um, out of the domain values, right? In Haskell and in Rust, we don't. We have enums and we have none and we have error. Uh, we have different mechanisms for dealing with uh, Sentinel values. So instead of using Sentinel values, you, sh you should use option and result. That is the idiomatic way of dealing with Sentinel values in, in uh, Haskell and Rust. In Haskell, it's a maybe and um, an either. Here is option and result. So match is good if let is good. All right. Iterators. Yes, that's a, a, a super important topic. And it's actually super tricky uh, to, to really understand all the bells and whistles of iterators. It takes time. That is the hard part of Rust. Um, so let's uh, have a sim simple use case. So um, a point. OK, nothing kind of unusual here. So we have a point, a two-dimensional co coordinate system. So now we have to write a, a distance function, which will count a distance between the two points. 
Cartesian distance, we're gonna use a uh, square root of the um of the of the vector distance between the two points. So we take um the uh, x minus x one minus x two, uh, y one minus y two. We square it, we sum it, and then we take a square root of it. Right. So we have a distance function here, which takes the the point which we are on working on, like the self, and the other point, and calculates the uh, the Cartesian distance. Nothing unusual here, right? Uh, why are we using distance as an implementation of the point? Kind of makes sense, right? Uh, we could have it separate uh, and make maybe some trades on things that have coordinates, but like without complicating life too much, that is perfectly reasonable thing to do. So we have our data structure and then we have our method which operates with some business logic on our data structure. Fine. It works fine. So now your task is you are giving a container of points and you, your task is to calculate the distances between consecutive points. So we have some container of point one, point two, point three, uh, and then we need a distance between one and two and between two and three. How are you gonna do this? Yep. Uh, yeah. So how would you actually do it? How would you kind of calculate it? So I, I, I give you a vector of points and you need to calculate the distances and give me a vector of distances back. Yeah. Good, good thinking. So I would uh, also use iterators, but uh, many of you would start with a loop. And many of you would say, well, you know, we can either do it through the iterators or we can do it through a loop. So let's have a look at the loop first. So we have our data. So we have three points. And then we are saying, okay, we will have our return thing. And we iterating over the points to calculate the distance between current one and the next one, right? So in the loop, the logic is we take current one and the, the neighbor, the, the next one, we calculate the distance. The devil is in this line. Is this line correct? Did I wrote the indexes correctly? Should I have minus one here or not? Should I have minus two maybe here? Maybe should I say from one to the length and go from I and I minus one? There is a lot of things can happen here. Is, is this line correct or not? Who, who, who thinks it's correct? And that is the problem. The problem of using for loop is exactly this. You can make bugs, you can make mistakes, right? Um, in Rust, this range is a little bit, uh, maybe like when I was learning Rust, it was a little bit counterintuitive because the first item is inclusive, the last item is exclusive. <laughs> so we are not taking the last item, but we're taking the first one. So we go from zero, so here, what is the VLAN? What, what's the value of VLAN for this, for, for this vector? Three. So VLAN is three. So VLAN minus one is what? It's two. So we have from zero to two. So if we take zero, it's zero and one. Then we have one, which is one and two, and then it's two, but exclusive in Rust, right? A little bit surprising for some, right? Because I mean, it it's an arbitrary decision if that range takes the last one or not, right? Uh, they decided it's not. 
Um, fine, fair enough. But you know, many programmers reading that code may not know that, right? So they may decide to say minus two, actually, right? Uh, because we should not take two. We should only take zero and one and stop the loop. So that leads to a lot of issues, right? It's kind of trivial, but you know, a lot of bugs are because of that line, right? Um, so the idiomatic way is to use iterators and actually to use this kind of a sliding window iterator. So Rust has this very nice concept of a sliding window iterator and you can take arbitrary size of the sliding window. In our case, we just need two because we need the current element and the next element, right? So we take the window of the, of the two elements and we slide over to the end each time taking the, the pair, right? So we, we sliding with the pair, we mapping over the pair of points. We have the current one and the next one. We calculating the distance and then we just collecting like um, dumping the, the results back, right? So it's a very concise, very idiomatic way of calculating it. And there is no way you actually make any index errors here because it's taken care for you, right? So I often watch lectures or, or um, you know, advanced programmers arguing that this type of code is more ugly or harder to read and they prefer a for loop, that the for loop is doing the same thing. It's the same code, right? But it's not. Objectively speaking, this code leaves errors, possibility of errors. This code doesn't leave the possibility of errors. So you should prefer this. Um, you may complicate life your life if you didn't know about the windows, sliding windows, and you kind of use the normal iterator and you did some magic with holding the temporary value of the current and the next one and so on. I've seen code and I've seen you doing it, right? Kind of don't do that. <laughs> Try to use the, the windows. Um, there, is a, um, there is a cool feature. Um, I don't, I cannot write here, but I can, I can write in the, so there is a cool feature of um, uh, Rust is trying, they, they will probably in, in inject it in, into, the, um, into the language. It's not in the language yet. Uh, let me find the point. Yeah, so here. So um, there is a, a proposal and it's in the nightly build where you can write this code like this. You can say let, um, let distance, the, yeah, let's call it D2 equals, and then you say V, same as, as before. But here, instead of saying window and specifying the size of the window, you say array windows, and then you don't specify, you don't specify anything because the compiler can infer it. And here you will say map, and in the map you will you will say how many parameters the map takes. So I can say v v1 and v2, and calculate distances like this, and then collect collect it into the. So with this code, it, it's it's exactly the same code, but you don't specify how big the window is because the compiler can infer from your map how many parameters you need. So here we need two consecutive uh, values. So it will say, yep, it will be a window of, of size two. And then you have kind of a nicer, uh, you have a nicer references because you have for each, you have your own variable, right? So here I, I can say, you know, uh, left and right. And then here I can say from left to right or something like this. I, I have a more meaningful code instead of this kind of an array with no names and, and indexes only, right? So th this will happen. Uh, it's, in the, um, it's in the works and it will kind of make your life even, even nicer, right? Uh, but this one is already in the language and you should kind of make use of it. Um, so, yep. All right, so that's... Um, the point. So let's have a short break and then we will talk about some edge cases. Um, so, 
five minutes. All right, uh, some edge cases, okay, and sentinel values. So here we have code for student. And same as with the point, we can um, implemented an increase age method on our instance, um, such that we add age to student. What's wrong with this code? Is there anything wrong with this code? Yeah. The age is too small. So let's say it's U128 and 128 here. Will the code be correct? Huh? Yeah, so you, you're kind of thinking like Bill Gates who said, uh, we only need eight characters for file names. Nobody ever will need more. Okay, I kind of get your point, but even if we increase it to U128, uh, there is still the same problem with the code. It's just that it more more uh, like you know even with U eight, uh, two fifty five. Who who get who will ever get to the two fifty five years? That's not possible, right? That that is not the problem. The problem is the overflow. If you have a database of students, and you're getting input from uh, from another person or from an administrator or from a file and somebody somewhere made a mistake which causes you to overflow you will have an overflow right no matter what you say here the overflow with u128 uh, can also happen and then what will happen yeah you will have a wrong um you will not crash you will have a wrong age because you overflow the student age and suddenly you have a value which is sort of wrong, but you don't know it, right? Yep, Rust wraps around. So Rust in debug mode will panic on overflow. Uh, and then in the release, it will wrap around by default. So the problem is that our model of data means that this operation can introduce inconsistency to our data if we take data from unsanitized data from the user and then uh, make the operation on the age, right? So now we have a kind of a dilemma because what 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 we like we implementing a method which basically has to check if there is an overflow or not. And in case of the overflow, what should happen? Should you crash? So imagine you have a web server. You're running a web server. You're reading some input from JSON file from some administration. They made a mistake. They kind of mixed up fields in the rows of the spreadsheet. And now instead of the age, they have a salary. And then they adding like uh, 250 to your age. And then this method overflows. Then what should happen? Should your server crash? No, we don't crash. But your server should detect that there is a problem. And it should notify that there is a problem, right? Do we need to attach any meaningful uh, information about the overflow or just say, ah, oh, there was a problem, there was an overflow? There, nothing else can go wrong here, right? It's just one thing that can go wrong, which is the overflow. So then we probably should use an option, right? We should say, yep, uh, 
This method can overflow the edge, which means we have this kind of uh, unhappy path, which is none, right? Like uh, we have a happy path and unhappy path. Uh, so then we need to in, like indicate it with an option. But if we were to indicate it with an option, we cannot use a method anymore. We have to have a function because we have to take a student, we have to take the age, and we have to either return uh, uh, some student or we have to return none because we have the overflow, right? So we cannot use a method. We have to switch to um, we have to switch to a function which takes a student, takes the age, and returns us uh, possibly a new student with a like actually it's the same student with a new age, or um, it kind of returns none in case of a wrong overflow, right? And this is uh, our initial implementation. So our initial implementation uh, checks if the age plus years overflows um, and then says none. And if it doesn't overflow, we just updating the age and returning some student. Will it work? Yep, it will work. Is the code smelly? Yep, the code is smelly. <laughs> Why do, how can you tell that the code is smelly? Because you manually handling happy and unhappy paths and you're using if statements. So that already rings some warning bells, right? Um, and you're doing a manual check for the overflow. If the language doesn't have a facility to, for, that, for this type of check, that's fair enough. But Rust has Rust has functions which check if there is an overflow or not. Uh, and for the release version, you kind of need to use them. So, okay, so let's get an, another shot. So the second shot is there is a function called checked add. And you also have checked multiplications, divisions. You have kind of a checked arithmetic operations which will check if the operation is correct or not, or overflow or doesn't, right? So here we have a improved implementation where we are checking if the adding years to age will overflow or not. If it doesn't overflow, we get some with the new age, new, new value. And if it doesn't, it kind of returns uh, none, right? So. This one will be a sum uh, returns true or false. And if it's true, that means uh, we got the, the, new, um, the new value correctly. So we say, yeah, that, that means it's safe to add the age to two years and we return some student. But if is sum is false, it means there's none, we're returning none, right? So we fixed one problem. We, we fixed the problem of the manual check but we still have smelly code because of handling this none uh, and sum. And that is an indicator of, of this is sum. Like every time you're calling unwrap or every time it's calling is sum or every time in Haskell you're calling from just, you're probably doing something wrong. You probably, there is a better way of solving it without you manually kind of inspecting the value and kind of doing it, right? So that is the case here as well. So the kind of the most idiomatic way of doing it uh, would be to just return uh, the um, none uh, if we, we have a sum, like we don't need, so this improvement is like, we don't need this variable at all. We can use the if statement as a if expression and return whatever that if expression gives us back. So one improvement is like observe that if is um, uh, expression in itself, and then if it is the last statement of the of the function, it can return what what it needs to return. So one simplification is this, but that's not enough because it's of this is some kind of ugliness. So this is kind of a clean way of solving it. Uh, and as you observe, there is no if statement anymore, right? So how this how this one works? Well, we checking for add, and then we have a boxed value. And as I told you, 
collections are not only kind of uh, maps and vectors, like uh, option is also a kind of a container and it has an iterator and you can map over the option. So what checked at returns is an option of the addition of years to age. So let's say this one is 21, this one is 21. So the return will be some 42. And then if, if that's the case, we can map over it. And then we have new age here. So we actually don't need to do the sum because we already did the sum. We already did the sum with the checked at. So then we kind of assigning, yep, the student is with the new age and then we're a returning student. If however, checked at returns none, the whole thing returns none, which is none returned from the function. So it's a very nice, clean way of solving it. It's very idiomatic and it's very similar to how you would do it in Haskell. It's pretty, exactly the same, right? Um, okay, one, yeah. Yeah, so the checked function uh, is, is, is better than our manual check because um, our manual check is uh, working only because um, th this function, th this check works only because we have unsigned integers. If by chance we had some, uh, for age it doesn't make sense, but if we had kind of a positive and negative values, that would have a bug because for some combinations, you would not detect an overflow uh, with this check. You would have to have additional checks. Uh, so it's a, a little bit unsafe, but exactly. Yeah, that's right. So the, uh, I still don't like this. Like it's it still, um, uh, yeah, it's, you know, po possible for error prone. So it, it's much better to use this th those uh, built-in functions for overflow and underflow. Uh, so this function will always return none if there is an overflow or underflow. Uh, our check was only for a specific case with unsigned and yeah. Um, so then there is one more observation. Uh, one more observation is that normally what we do is we are increasing the age of student and maybe doing other things, right? So this increase age of a student is a function which we will probably use as a manipulation on student objects uh, in some sort of a pipeline. So for example, we might be checking like uh, uh, updating the bank account or updating the name or doing some things, some other things, and then also increasing the age, right? Uh, so what would be nice actually to have like a happy path, which means it takes an option of a student and returns an option of a student instead of taking a student directly. Because if we do that, we can chain those calls one after another because then we can pass this result to the next function, right? To the, to the next function of the same signature. You see that? It will allow us to compose processing. So we can say, yep, uh, do this, and then do this, and then do this, and then if any of those steps fails, then we get to an unhappy none path, and we're done. But if all of them work, then we get this option student. We did that in Haskell uh, often, and it's exactly the same in Rust. So this is also this will work. This is idiomatic, but if I were doing it, I would check change it to take an option of a student, so the input and output would match such that I can chain the, the processing, right? So then if we do that, um, so yeah, first uh, avoid unwrap is some and other unboxing. If you can avoid it, you should avoid it. Um, and then I would uh, introduce the option of a student, which returns the option. And look, there is um, a very nice Rust construct called and then, which basically looks almost exactly the same. So this code, look, look, observe this code. It's like we taking this, the age of the student, we doing the checked ed of years, and then we mapping, and then we're returning the student. This code is almost identical. We taking the age of the S, uh, mapping it, returning S. And the only thing which we need to do is wrap it with the end then, 
for the option here, right? So Rust actually encourages you to do that because it makes life easy for you with this. Um, how did I discover those things? Well, this one I actually discovered with Clippy because what I did first was I did student map, got the student, did this second map, and then I here I said flatten because I had an option inside the option, right? And then Clippy said, look, 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 Marius, you're doing two maps with flatten. It's a very common pattern and Rust is solving it by and then. <laughs> it's like, whoa, great. So then and then is basically that, right? It's uh, kind of um, solving you the second map here and the flat flattening at the end, right? How do I know those concepts? I know all those concepts from Haskell, right? So all those concepts are not new to me. Like uh, I, I already were familiar with them, right? If you're learning Rust straight away, that is probably really complicated to kind of follow, right? But if you already played with it in Haskell, then it's exactly the same. It's just that you are doing it slightly differently, like with the and then, right? We didn't have the need for and then in Haskell because um, doing kind of a recursive maps and flattening, yeah, that's the way you do it, right? Uh, here you have a kind of a, a more ergonomic um, structure. Um, all right, uh, again, how do I learn about those functions? Well, you kind of need to read the docs. You need to watch some other people's code, uh, idiomatic code. Uh, you should not watch code from Stack Overflow or from uh, ChatGPT because often it's not the correct way. Uh, but often if you tell ChatGPT, can you rewrite it in the most idiomatic Rust way, you may discover kind of a, a better patterns, right? All right, so when you think about iterators, think about them not only as containers for doing for loops, but think of them as functors. So in this particular case, uh, the student is a functor and uh, um, the operation which we did returns us another functor and then we're mapping over it, right? Um, so it, it's, it, it's, it very feels like, um, like, doing, um, like doing Haskell. All right. So one more thing, um, mapping. So here we use map and you are all familiar with, with how map works uh, from Haskell or from uh, other things. So you have some box and then you have a function which takes this argument, the content of the box and then puts the return inside the box, right? Um, in Rust, um, sometimes you need to do that but if the box is empty, you want to default to something. You want to default to some value, okay? Um, so um, I don't have the, I, uh, okay, I, I think I have the example in, yeah, anyway, we, we kind of running a little bit out of time. So um, with map or uh, you can um, instead, so you're basically saying there is a default value, and then I have this function which works on the on the boxed value if if it has a value, otherwise return me the default value, right? So it's it's kind of like um, uh, we have some x with uh, with sum, and then we say okay x map or return me forty two if there is none, otherwise do this on the on the v, right? Uh, and then in the test, we are comparing it. Uh, and then if, if we have none, it will return me the default value. So there is no kind of magic here, right? Uh, it's, it's kind of additional thing for saying, I need to do this on the boxed value, but if the box is empty, just return me this, right? What is more interesting is map or else. And map or else is um, often used in kind of a pipeline. And a very good kind of example they have in the docs is this one. So I've seen also code uh, from you where you need to do something with uh, arguments and then you have a lot of iterators and a lot of if checks, if something is not empty, do this, otherwise do this, blah, 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 right? Um, you can kind of exp express it in a much more concise way by chaining this kind of um, working with the boxes. Um, 
So here we have uh, some sort of a container of arguments, command line arguments, and we're saying, give me the first one, not the zeroth one, but the first one. But the command line arguments may not have it. They may not have the first argument, right? So in, in this one returns as an option of either the first string or nothing. Uh, and then if there is nothing, so it says map or else, if there is nothing, we reading kind of a standard configuration file from the hard coded value. But if the if there was a value, we wrap it in okay. Uh, so there is a little bit of magic here because um, what this line achieves, this one says it's an option of a string which is consumed by this map and this map turns it into a kind of a, a string but inside a result instead of an option. So in, in, this, in this line, we going away from the option and we turning it into a result. Why? Because this function can fail. So reading from a file can fail and give us a result. So we basically can have uh, an error or okay. Uh, if we have okay, we, we have the string, we have the content of the file, uh, but if we are not doing the unhappy path, we are on the happy path, we have to wrap it into the okay instead, right? So we're going from some string to okay string. Do you get it? Took me a while to kind of uh, work it out, but it's like, once you get it, like it's, oh, that's so nice, right? Uh, and then once we have it, then we check if there was an error, because if there was an error, we have to stop because we don't have anything to parse. But if there was no error, then we parsing. What we are parsing? We parsing the string, which is from okay string, right? So here we have some string or none. If we have none, we have the unhappy check. So then we uh, we read from the uh, hard coded config file. If that fails, we stop because we don't have anything. But if that one succeeds, we we parsing the content, but if this one succeeded, we're not doing this, we're just wrapping it into okay. Um, so, the, you know, instead of doing two ifs or, or, or three if statements, we express it in this kind of a nice linear path, kind of a pipeline with this map or else and this question mark, right? So every time you're using question marks, every time you're using map, and every time you sort of nicely have code looking like this, you probably doing it in an idiomatic rust way. Every time you have for loops or if statements, especially nested ones, and every time you kind of checking if something is not empty, you, manually yourself, you probably can rewrite it in, in this kind of format, right? And this format is very like Haskell because in Haskell, we basically were changing things this way, right? Um, so Rust is kind of hard because you sort of need to, um, start thinking, uh, how can I express it in this kind of a happy path and have the shortcuts for the unhappy paths, right? All right, so let's, let's talk about learning. So this part is based on a talk which was given uh, two years ago in NDC uh, in Oslo. Um, and I really like the talk. Um, there is one small thing I don't like, like uh, the, the author of the talk, he doesn't care if something is an expression or statement. <laughs> it's like, no, it's an expression, it's not a statement. So I'm kind of uh, very uh, pecu peculiar on differentiating what is a statement, what is an expression, uh, for the reason that I told you at, at the beginning of the course, that statements are not composable, expressions are, right? Um, so in Rust, it, it makes a difference if if is used as a statement or if if is used as an ex expression, right? Um, anyway, so uh, what's wrong with kind of not caring what you don't know? Yeah, there is a lot wrong with that. We should not postpone um, not knowing what we don't know until later. So um, the topic is quite difficult uh, and it's also quite complex, but the bottom line is that it boils down to those four things. So like, how do you learn? What is your method? Um, what are the perceptions of what works and what doesn't and how your perceptions might be wrong and what 
you your perceptions may need to take into account. So those two things kind of are not about your emotions. They are about like the, the kind of objective reality, right? Um, the gratification is about us and motivation also. So those two are about our own emotions. And we sometimes prefer to be inefficient or ineffective or, um, you know, um, not doing the things that we should because we feel kind of not, like doing it, okay? Uh, we procrastinating, or we are preferring something that re rewards us, but it doesn't really teaches us anything new, right? Um, so when I came to to Jovig, I started climbing with Rune, and I had kind of a hard time uh, climbing in in the climbing wall, and I mastered like one of the routes, and I was doing it all all the time because I felt good about myself, like I could do this kind of a hard moves and kind of do it, and then Rune came to me and said, Mariusz, like, stop doing it. Like, uh, like, if you continue doing it, you will not progress. You will not learn anything new. Like, you already know how to do this one. Do the, the ones you cannot do. But it felt so bad. Like, the, the one I could do felt so good. Like, it motivated me and kind of uh, make me kind of feel good about myself. The one I couldn't to put me down. Like, I, I felt bad about myself, right? Uh, and that is, th those are those two points. Uh, Actually, every time you feel bad about yourself, that's a good thing because you're learning. That that's that's where the progress and that's where the learning happens. Uh, every time you're doing something that feels like you are the master, you kind of uh, feel good. That most of the time it doesn't teach you anything. It's it's sort of like uh, you you should stop doing that. Um, okay, let's skip that. Uh, so then uh, the big thing about failure is that. Um, it, it is a good thing. Um, so um, failing at something actually teaches you and succeeding in something don't really teaches you anything. Um, so there is this kind of a big thing about uh, enjoying kind of failing, enjoying falling from the wall, like uh, trying to climb and then falling, right? And, and not being able to do that. It's like, you, you know, uh, climbing is kind of different to programming because you have those uh, basic human sort of uh, reflexes and fears, right? Uh, that you fear of falling, right? But it, it's the same uh, that you, like I actually enjoy doing something wrong and being shown the correct way, right? Uh, so if I do something in non-idiomatic way and someone tells me like Clippy tells me like, yeah, you did it wrong, you do it like this, I actually, it, it's very enjoyable. Like, it's like, great, I learned something new, right? I kind of know and then now, and I will remember that, right? If I use map and, and flatten, I knew that from before, I, I didn't learn anything new by, by doing it, right? And solving a task. But by doing it wrong and learning about it, and then that, that's great. So embrace it. So then uh, I have um, some video. So I do encourage you to watch the, the talk, the whole talk but I have uh, some highlights. So I have two small parts, which I want us to watch together. And probably, um, yeah, I will record it, but um, yeah, YouTube may not, not like it. Uh, so, so maybe, uh, maybe I not record it. So YouTube doesn't like kind of uh, people showing larger content of other videos in your video because they uh, worry about the uh, copyright. So I will pause and then you watch it kind of those people who watch it at home uh, in the video, they you have to play the, the video yourself. Right, so uh, please watch the, the whole video at home and um, uh, it, it kind of motivates a little bit the, desi uh, the design and the, the structure of the course uh, such that I would like really to have a little bit more languages like Kotlin and maybe Erlang. Erlang is also very interesting from the perspective of uh, agent model or kind of a concurrency. Um, but that, that I know students would hate it. And I know there will be a lot of a backlash, right? Um, so I, I'm kind of balancing what is the best like to explain and to kind of cover with keeping the negative uh, feedback from the students to the minimum. Uh, but as he explains, like we 
feel certain things which are not necessarily effective or not, not necessarily good for us. And that is sort of the, the balancing act, right? So I, I really enjoyed uh, his talk. I, I watched it earlier and I, I did a lot of changes from last, last year in the course based on the study results that he highlighted. Uh, and I think he talks a little bit more about um, kind of uh, the, the need for asking questions and, and for need to kind of exploring um, and kind of a hitting the wall and then kind of solving it as sort of a main drivers for, for progress. Um, so yeah, please, please watch the talk and um, yeah, we can discuss it a little bit later, uh, a little bit more next week. So next week, what I will do is I will cover a little bit about cash locality and a little bit about profiling, uh, which are kind of a more uh, relevant for, for Rust uh, or where the performance matters. Um, but if you have any other ideas or maybe that we need to cover something in the class that cause, causes problems, then please let me know so I can include additional material and additional explanations. So yeah, thank you for today. Any questions? All right, great.